invasion theory, I said you can get five lakhs. Then, then so many people they joined in. Please, please, please hold it, hold it. They joined in, and the purse kept becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So right now, before I started this session, the purse was one crore. Anybody who can prove Aryan invasion theory, the purse is one crore. <laughs> and maybe by the time I end, I have very rich people here, it could even become two crores. So you never know. The point of all this is that you must understand this. Why I am saying that I have announced a prize to prove this because Aryan invasion theory is a theory which has never been proved. It is exactly like I think some of you have attended yesterday's sessions and we talked about axioms and biblical dates and the biblical truth which is just by a command that okay there is a command then there was word and word was law and word was God whatever is said you cannot challenge the word so it is something like that I think Dr. David Frawley knows quite a bit about it Dr. David Frawley had started speaking against this Aryan invasion theory when uh, I think I was in college and um, some of the other gentlemen had not even gone to college so let us first trace the history of what is being taught as history I am giving you this background this session is going to be slightly longish so anybody wants to have water or whatever I think most of the people were outside anyway so they all uh, refreshed for this session. So, how did it happen? When the Islamic invader came into India, he did not bother about these things. Of course, they were not even interested in history. All they had was a book and anything that was not in the book uh, did not need to exist. So, they destroyed anything that came in the way. They destroyed libraries, they destroyed temples, they destroyed what they called idols and what we called murtis or whatever else they could lay their hands upon they simply destroyed because according to them all the knowledge of the world was in one book and nothing else was required everybody could live their life by it so they were not really bothered about these things what happens is that when the western traders come in they came in uh, uh, initially as traders and when the first contacts began and a lot of them realized that they had come into contact with a civilization which really did not need to be discovered I don't know have you have you heard of the doctrine of discovery anyone here Bacho, aapne kisi ne doctrine of discovery suna you heard of discovery of India of course You've heard of uh, that Vasco da Gama discovered India? Kisne kisne suna? Okay. All of them know that Vasco da Gama discovered India. Did India used to exist before Vasco da Gama or not? Okay. Then why did Vasco da Gama or Columbus went on a discovery trip? Why did they have to discover it? Let me tell you this is this is a doctrine of the Catholic Church and the doctrine of Catholic Church was again similar to what was there in the other book and it was that we know whatever is there in this book and anything else that we discover becomes ours and they, gave, they announced prizes not exactly like the small prize that I've announced, but very big prizes. So anybody who goes and discovers anything, you discover a land, it becomes yours. You discover a person or a human being, becomes yours, becomes your slave. Or any property that you get, it all becomes, anyone who discovers becomes yours. 
when they first came to India, they had this great difficulty because this was already a place teeming with millions and millions of people. So even if uh, they have discovered it, how do they lay it? They claim to it. So that was one part of the problem. The second part of the problem was that some of the really well-educated <coughs> people who came, they, they became so much influenced by the culture of this country, they were called the Romantics. So when the Romantics went back and they carried the tale of a great civilization, the initial movement uh, that happened in the West, I don't know, the, no, uh, most people would not have learned about it. Arvindan has written a whole book on it. It's called Breaking India, along with uh, uh, Rajiv Malhotra. So he will be telling more uh, about this. So I'll just briefly touch upon this and say that they were greatly romanticized by the idea of having a great civilization and being the first one from the West to connect to it, one. And second, when they also learned that it has a great language which is very similar to their language, they got even more thrilled. And they said that we belong to a great civilization and that that time the conflict was between the Christians and the Muslim and they said that we belong to that great civilization, we are superior to Arabs. This is how this all began. Now the church got alarmed, said that this is not on, because if the, the, this uh, carries on, then uh, it is going to threaten our foundation. And this is about the time that the Renaissance had started taking place in Europe. So a whole new movement began, which uh, touched upon that uh, linguistic part. And I think Aravinda knows in much greater detail about it. And then they said that this language has actually traveled from the west to the east. And also because the timeline given in the Bible is infallible. So all this talk about this being a very ancient land is uh, all, oh, okay, let me shorten it, all BS. And uh, we can't possibly allow anything of this kind of uh, a narrative to develop. So they started a counter narrative. They hired some Sanskrit scholars, Max Miller being the foremost of them. Before that, uh, William Jones had done some work. They took his work. They employed, East India Company employed Max Muller to undermine the Sanskrit scholarship of India. And this is the genesis of RN invasion theory because we got such a huge panel of scholars. I will not go deeper into it. They will deal with this. <clears throat> then, I'll just tell you, the, there are three pillars of this Aryan invasion theory. The three pillars are that there was an Aryan race. Okay, one, that there was an Aryan race. Number two, it originated somewhere around the Caucasus. You know Caucasus? Boys, girls? Where is Caucasus? South of Russia? Please look up your geography books. Google it. So it originated somewhere in the Eastern Europe, around the Caucasian mountains. Then these people, of course they also had some horses, which we have never found yet in India. So they had horses and they invaded Northwest India. And the whole thing happened somewhere around 1500 BC, between 1500. The beauty of these arguments is that even if you take one pillar out of these four, the whole theory collapses. They themselves realized it. Even though a lot many people kept writing about it, but after they realized it, even Romila Thapar went on to say that this is Aryan migration theory. And uh, of course, my friend here, Mr. Abhijit Chawla, has added one more facet to it. He says that's uh, now going to become what is called Aryan tourism theory. So, from Aryan invasion to Aryan migration to Aryan tourism. But my contention is there is nothing called Aryan. 
There is nothing called Aryan as a race in the first place. So whatever you may call it, but it is a tourism theory now. And when people like Aurobindo and Tilak challenge these, they were called communal. After independence, there was so much of evidence against it. Okay, till this point, nobody has produced any evidence. They are only hypotheses. And those hypotheses have no proof, except some quibbling around linguistics. Yet, it becomes an established theory. After independence, it becomes even more established. Why it happened, our panel would discuss. Then, uh, when archaeological excavations happened in Dwarka, Dr. B.B. Lal was earlier a proponent of the Aryan invasion theory. After doing the Dwarka ex ex excavations, he came to the conclusion that there is no such thing. That the so-called Indus Valley civilization goes much farther back. They came to the conclusion, the archaeology has concluded that this is basically Saraswati Indus civilization. And it is corroborated by literature. Literature of Rigved, which mentions not only Saraswati, uh, also Indus, but Saraswati is much bigger even before Indus. And now we have got uh, sites in Haryana. Biranna goes about uh, 8,000 years, 8,000 years old. The site in Biranna in Haryana is about 8,000 years old. Rakhi Gadi is slightly less. Rakhi Gadi is now the largest site, much bigger than Mohanjo Dado, which used to be the earliest site. Do you read about Rakhi Gadi in your books? Anyone? Anyone has read? No, sir, I am asking the students. Anyone knows Rakhi Gadi? Suna kisi ne? Aap ne? Ne bachcho se pooch raho. Nahi suna, sir. They don't know about Rakhi Gadi which is the largest site. They only heard about Mohanjo Adappa because the text, quote-unquote, have not been changed. After that, archaeology evidence itself was very clinching, but they said, no, we need more. So the geological evidence came. They said, we need even more. Then people even brought in river morphology, maritime evidence, all kind of evidence was brought in. From the literature, astronomical evidence was brought in. Still said no. So then I said, okay, okay, you will keep saying no. Let you prove it. And I'm giving you a bounty, one crore. By the end of the session, it will be two crores. In between, if you can prove it, it will be 1.5. So AIT to AMT to ATT and then they said, okay, no, 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 no. Genetics is our greatest aid. So the genetics proves that this migration happened somewhere it happened. Maybe it happened in the Swat Valley. Maybe it happened around the fringes, but something must have happened. So we've got an um, eminent uh, genetics expert here, Dr. Neeraj Rai whose name you might have heard, if you've really been keeping... Aap sabko civil services mein appear hona hai? Hona hai kya? Hona hai? Kisko kisko nahi hona hai? Sabko hona hai. Toh bhai, inka naam aap dhyan se padlo. Aur inko sun lo. Today you have the good fortune of listening to him in person. He is the man who has destroyed the Aryan invasion theory by the favorite method of the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory, that is genetics. So now, so much for the introduction. This is the introduction to the topic. I have gone into this detailed in introduction because most of the people are not aware of the dimensions of this, why it is done. What are the reasons why it was proposed? I have only touched briefly upon it. Now I will sit down and I will ask my panel scholars to elaborate on these points further. So 
uh, I'll request Dr. David Frawley because uh, he was the first among all of us to point out these contradiction in this particular theory. Uh, yes. The Aryan invasion theory was invented from a European perspective and it had no basis in India or its uh, traditions. What we have in the Indian context, I'm going to focus on one aspect of this uh, data because we have experts in different fields. First, I want to acquaint you more with Vedas. The Vedas, which are dated most conservatively to 1500 BC, are probably much older than that, probably 5,000 years or more. They are by far the largest and most sophisticated literature that we possess from the ancient world. There's nothing of the scope or depth from Egypt, from Mesopotamia, Babylonia, anywhere at all. You just have little fragments of things here and there. Now, in the, Vedic, in the Hindu tradition, Vedas are products of rishis, sages. Uh, they have deep spiritual, psychological knowledge, as well as knowledge of the universe and cosmic forces. And we all know Vedas are the basis of the Sanskrit language. Sanskrit is even regarded by the modern science as the most scientific and sophisticated of the languages. If we look at the Vedas, they are composed in very complex metrical forms. Vedas are called chandas, which means the meter or the poetry. Uh, they also, the Vedic language is etymologically consistent. They explain the meaning of words relative to specific roots, like Agni is fire and then various uh, derivatives of that. And so what we find is a very self-contained language, not a language of people coming from the outside with a lot of borrowed terminology from the languages of the people that they came in who were already there. So this huge corpus, Rig Veda alone is over a thousand hymns. You add the additional Vedic literature, you go on to several, many thousands of pages, many different rishis and lines of teachings. Such a literature was produced over a long period of time. It required dynastic support, support of kings. How can we even today support a literature like that? So that literature with its sophistication and its depth, its breadth, its antiquity requires a civilization to support it. The Aryan invasion theory said the Vedas were the rantings of nomadic steppe people as they invaded and plundered India. And yet the Vedas speak of a land of seven rivers from ocean to ocean. They have a various multi-leveled oceanic universe. The rivers, the oceans of India are all there in the text and very great deep, even all your basic terms, karma, dhyana, mantra, yoga, rishi, prana, so many things. These terms and their equivalents are already there in the oldest Vedic text. So we have this great literature and the Aryan invasion theory deprived it of any civilization to support it. At the same time, when they interpreted this Indus or what we now call Indus Saraswati culture by the Aryan invasion, they said that the literature of that civilization did not endure, it disappeared. No trace was left. So the point I make very simply on this issue is that if we take the Vedic literature and all of its vastness and sophistication, which really cannot be denied, and we take the urban civilization and its background in ancient India through Hindu, Saraswati, Kurukshetra, all these places, just equate them. They come from the same place. They have the same tradition. They have the same continuity. You solve the mystery of a history without, of a civilization without a literature, and a literature that's very sophisticated without a civilization. And the continuity is continued. But at the same time, 
any Aryan invasion theory gets uh, destroyed. In any case, in the Vedic literature, there's no mention of an outside homeland. Homeland is Saraswati down to the ocean. Uh, there's no mention of Aryans as a race. Arya is a term meaning nobility. Buddha called his religion Arya Dharma also. So there is no history of these ideas of the Western Aryan invasion in the literature. And the literature itself stands as a proof of the antiquity and sophistication of the Vedic culture. And I would also say we should give somebody an award if they can prove that nomadic steppe people can not only produce and sustain the Vedic literature over thousands of years. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you very much. As I told you, by the time we finish, we'll probably add to the corpus. Now I would request uh, Aravindan, he's done uh, seminal research in uh, the reasons for the development of Aryan invasion theory in Europe, Aravindanji. The Aryan invasion theory has its roots in something called mosaic ethnography. This mosaic ethnography in turn is based on a biblical story. This biblical story is a very interesting one. You all should have heard about Noah. How many of the students know of Noah and Noah's flood? Noah and Noah's flood? Okay. So it is this story in Bible. Bible, God created the world as you know. And then suddenly one day he realized that the world has become very corrupt and all these people are very bad. So he decides to destroy the entire creation by sending a flood. But he chooses one person called Noah and he wants to save him and his family. And Noah has three sons, Ham, Shem, Japheth. And Noah, his wife, his sons and his children, they alone are saved in a big boat or ark. And after the deluge is over, these people climb down from the ark and they were sitting there and Noah gets drunk. He gets so drunk that like all our drunkards, he was lying down naked. This is all in Bible. He was lying down naked. And Ham looked at Noah lying down naked, drunk. Ham laughed at him. Whereas Shem and Japheth covered his nakedness. Now Noah, when he came back to the census, he understood what happened. He got so angry, he cursed Ham, telling that, you and your descendants would always be slaves of uh, the descendants of Shem and Japheth. And when colonialism started, wherever the colonialists went, they imposed this mythology of theirs as the history of the places they colonized. So they always wanted to say, somehow or other, that inhabitants of a particular place were descendants of uh, Ham, the civilization was called Hamitic civilization. As late as 1940s, you can find this terminology, Hamitic civilization. The Egyptian civilization was Hamitic civilization. African civilizations were Hamitic civilizations. Indian civilization was Hamitic civilization. But then comes uh, William Jones. He discovers linguistic relation between English and Sanskrit, ancient Greek and Sanskrit, Latin and Sanskrit, and now, they realize that somehow these lowly brown-skinned heathens are related to the white-skinned, blue-eyed Europeans. How do you explain this? So they create this concept that originally India, after the floods and everything, the descendants of Ham first came into India. They were here. And then came the descendants of Japheth through the same Kaiba Poland passes. Remember this. According to the Aryan invasion theory, not only the Aryans came through Kaiba Poland passes, even the Dravidians came through Kaiba Poland passes, but they were the initial inhabitants, they created the civilization, and everything. Then the Aryans came and destroyed it. So before that, this was the prototype. In the prototype, these Hamitic people were here. They were by nature morally decadent. They were by nature prone to slavery. And came the Japhetic people. They tried to 
civilized these people. Unfortunately, what happened? They started intermarrying with these people, and because of that, the race has fallen. And now they have gone into idol worshipping and all these kind of things. Then come the British, the Aryan cousins, who are here to civilize all the people and make them all, uplift them all. So this is essentially the basis, the biblical basis of uh, Aryan invasion theory, which is called the mosaic ethnology, which has been applied not only to India, but wherever the British are, for that matter, the European colonies went, they implied this framework and it resulted, for example, in Rwanda, it resulted in genocide. In India, it could not happen, but in Sri Lanka, it happened because the Sinhalese were identified as Aryan and the Tamils were identified as Dravidian. In fact, if you take a Sinhalese and if you take a uh, Tamil and make them stand together, and if you make them talk their language, for a third person, it would look like variants of a dialect, and they would be completely similar to each other all the ways. So this is essentially the biblical roots of Aryan invasion theory. And then came a reverse. The reverse was that these Aryans invaded, the Dravidians were here, the Dravidians were enslaved, their civilization was destroyed, Aryans imposed their caste system, and they created this priestcraft through which uh, uh, these people were enslaved forever through the generations, and now the Britishers have come to liberate the non-Aryan people of India. So these are the two variants of the Aryan invasion theory. Wonderfully explained. Even if uh, one did not know anything about the Aryan invasion theory, after this explanation of Arvindan, I think he could easily write a paper. Another person who has been writing on the various facets of uh, AIT is Abhijit Chawla. And uh, he also has the credit of demolishing the AIT on social media very capably. So I would ask Abhijit to go in next because he has also studied the other scientific aspects of counter AIT. Abhijit, please. Thank you, Sanjayji. Right, so if we were to put the Aryan invasion theory in a nutshell, in very brief, it concerns the question of the origin of Hinduism and the Sanskrit language. And the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory or the Aryan migration theory, these proponents insist that Hinduism and the Sanskrit language are foreign in origin. They are not, they are not indigenous to India. They claim that Hinduism and Sanskrit are, came into India via invasion. The, ones who, the people who brought them into India are white-skinned Brahmins, casteist people who invaded India, conquered India and imposed their foreign culture, their foreign religion and foreign language onto the hapless natives who happened to be the Dalits and the, and the Dravidians and the SCs and STs. And today, those people are, are, the, are oppressed and that, that is the cause of all the problems in India today. So the Aryan invasion theory that we have today or the Aryan migration theory, its newer iteration, is simply a continuation of the colonial project to divide India, to denigrate Indian culture, to denigrate Hinduism and to, and to impose a kind of social, social justice narrative by which they want to project themselves as the savior, saviors of India and they want, to, they want to introduce their foreign religion and foreign culture into India. So that is the Aryan invasion theory in a nutshell. Now, initially the Aryan invasion theory was based on linguistic and uh, racial grounds. They proposed an Aryan race. However, if you look at all the evidence that we have today, there is no such thing as an Aryan race. The, there is no such thing as a, as a Aryan Dravidian divide in India. Genetics has proved that the people of northern India and the people of southern India are very much similar genetically. There is no significant difference between a, people, a, a person in South India and a person in North, North India or West India and East India. Genetics also tells us that India is the world's most diverse 
population outside Africa. We have incredible diversity among in our, inside our population. And we also have an incredible linguistic diversity. So India is a very interesting place. It's a gold mine if you, if you are looking for genetic research and linguistic research. Now, since they did not find any evidence to prove, the in, to prove that there was an Aryan invasion of India, I mean, there's no evidence. If you look at the archaeological record, if you look at other, other evidence, there's no evidence of the invasion of India, of any kind of invasion of India. That's why the theory was modified to turn it into a gradual migration of Aryans into India, which had the same consequences of oppression and suppression of the local culture. Now, even that, even there's no evidence for even that, that also. Now, the last thing that they are relying on is genetic evidence. They claim that there is, there is genetic evidence of, of, of of a migration into India, the so-called steppe origin. And uh, Dr. Neeraj Rai has done significant research about the R1A uh, haplogroup, R1A lineage. And his forthcoming paper is going to demolish even the genetic basis of the claim of the Aryan invasion or migration. So once we go through all the, all the panelists over here, it will be very, very much clear that, that the Aryan invasion theory or the migration theory is pretty much dead. But that does not mean that our work has to end, because there is so much that we, we do not know. There, is, there are incredibly large gaps in our history, in our understanding of our history. We have absolutely no idea of what happened, to, what happened in India chronologically before the age of the Buddha and, the, and before the time of the Mauryan dynasty. There's absolutely no knowledge. We have an, a significant archaeological record that goes back nearly 10,000 years. So our work now, our task, is to identify what happened in the, in the centuries and millennia before the Mauryan dynasty. For example, what we need to do is we need to get a handle on the dates of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Now people say these are myths, but there is evidence to show that these are not myths. For example, we have the evidence of the city of Dwarka, under the sea, precisely where the Mahabharata, the so-called myth, says it would be. So that demolishes the claim that this is a myth. And similarly, we have the evidence of the Rama Setu, precisely where the myth says it would be. So we have archaeological evidence for the Ramayana as well as for the Mahabharata. And we need to date these events. At least, we need to be, we need to be at least able to place them in a certain millennium whether it's the 5th millennium BCE, 7th millennium, whatever it is. So that is something that needs to be done. And uh, so, so there's a significant amount of work that still needs to be done. We also need to date the Vedas. We have absolutely no idea when the Vedas were written. Some people claim they, they were written in the, uh, around 1500 BCE, the Rig Veda. Some people claim it was written, written, written much, much, uh, much before that. We need to find a way of dating the Vedas, especially the Rig Veda. And the evidence of the river Saraswati could give us some kind of a clue. So there's much to be done. But, uh, and what, needs to, what is happening right now is that we have people working in, in isolation, people working in silos. You have linguists working in isolation from other disciplines. We have archaeologists working with no idea of what's happening in genetics and linguistics. What's needed is a multidisciplinary approach. People from all these different disciplines coming together, conferring with each other and trying to solve the problem. So it would be nice if the government could, could create an institute of Indian studies or something, fund it properly, have teams of geneticists, archaeologists, linguists, computer scientists, Geologists, hydrologists, everybody working together. I mean, computer science can go a long way towards solving the linguistic issues. Because if you, took, if you look at Sanskrit, Sanskrit is, a, is an extremely precise language. It's, it's almost algorithmic and mathematical in nature. Panini and Sanskrit is entirely algorithmic in nature. Panini devised a set of rules that can entirely explain the entire syntax of, of Sanskrit and, and the grammar of Sanskrit. So, Artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used to create a morphological model of the language and to identify its proximity or dis distance from other languages, thereby giving us an idea of when which language evolved first and when, when its descendants evolved and it, 
that that could help us solve some of these issues basically linguistics needs to be rescued from the realm of the humanities and brought into the realm of the sciences because that's where it really belongs so there are many open issues right now and uh, it would be great if the if the government could fund a proper program of research into all this and hopefully i'd like to see that happen soon thank you thank you abhijit you summed it up very nicely uh, now i'll announce the protocol for the questions as in the last sessions the questions have to be written out on a slip and uh, You, uh, please write out the questions on the slip and send it as, it as was being done in the previous session. The jury, may I request Mr. Shankar Sharan? Sorry? Okay, they have agreed? Sorry. We already have uh, um, Abhijit, uh, Ayer Mitra and uh, Sandeep Balakrishna to judge the best questions and because this is the last session, so we will uh, take more questions and we may also award more questions. So we will we'll give um, one, two, three. So please judge one, two, three. We will give three prizes in this session and we will take uh, at least ten questions, that's my promise. Uh, I will request Mr. Shiva Shastri, who otherwise his uh, area of ex expertise is different, but he has been investing a lot of time in this field, uh, just as many of us have been doing, though uh, I think uh, almost all of us, uh, AIT is not our field of study, but we invest a lot of time as students and as concerned Indians. Mr. Shastri. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to see a lot of young people here because you people have to know something. I think you all know the concept of light year. Light year is not a year, it's not a, it's not a measurement of time, it's a measurement of distance. So unfortunately, this Aryan invasion theory suffers from the same problem. Aryan invasion is not about, is less about invasion, it is more about language. Basically what happened is that in Europe, countries were divided, nations were made up of languages. So you have Spain, Spanish, France, France, French, uh, England, English, uh, Germany, German. So they believed that one language meant one nation. They knew all these languages were similar, but they didn't know why they were similar until somebody came to India and found Sanskrit. And because of Sanskrit, they found that all the, they found the reason why all these languages were similar. But since Sanskrit was such an advanced language, and it was being spoken by brown or black people, they said, how can brown or black people have such a great language? So that is when they started saying that this language cannot have started in India. It must have started somewhere between Europe and Russia. And the people came and invaded India. And how did they say, and who were the people who came? You see the word Arya is there in the, in the Vedas. Now it's like this, you see the word Sundari. What does the word Sundari mean? Sundari means beautiful woman. You don't have a race of Sundarians. Same way, the word Arya is an adjective, a noble person. You do not have a race of Aryans. And I would like to s stop with one point. I'd just like I would hand it over to the expert Neeraj Rai. If no, 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 no. Please, please Sorry. carry on. We want to hear you more. Uh, we, we've got a lot of time on this session. Yeah. And I've just been told that there will also be a, a short session of interaction after this as well. So please carry on. Thank you. This is, yeah. The, the, see, the important thing to remember is, Genes, you know, you all know about genes, you're all senior school students, you know genetics, you know that the body consists of, you know, chromosomes. Now, genes do not tell you about language. If you have somebody who travels from India, a couple who travel from India to America or to someplace, say, say France, and then they have 
of a child who learns French in France. The child's genes are not going to show French genes. So, you cannot say from the genes that a person speaks a particular language. So, genetics cannot be used to prove language. Then why is everybody saying genetics language, genetics language? It's very simple. Let me explain this to you. In science, now supposing, in, uh, supposing I am a scientist who wants to write about how to make pots. I am making pots. But what happens is, I want to, I make pots on a wheel. I cannot say how the wheel originated. Some other person has done that. So when I write my scientific paper, I write my views on how to make pots. But then I say, Mr. XYZ has shown how to make the wheel. I have, uh, you know, this is how a wheel is made. The same way in genetics papers, when they look at genes of maybe people who have moved from one place to another, they have to quote somebody. Whom do they quote? They quote these racist linguists. These linguists who have made up the story, they made up the story, they have made up languages, they have made up a language called Indo-Iranian language. There is no such thing as Indo-Iranian language. And I am sorry to say a lot of people may disagree with me, these people have also cooked up a language called Avestan. If wherever you read on the internet or in books, if you talk about Zoroastrians, that is Parsis, they will say Parsis used to speak Avestan, how do they know? How do they know they used to speak Avestan 3000 or 4000 years ago? They have just made up the language, they have made up the language using books that were written 1500 or 2000 years later. So unfortunately, there has been a lot of cookery that has gone on and we have been subjected to a lot of lies and I'm sorry to say, particularly from linguists and from people who are called philologists. If you know the term philology, is people who, who talk about the history of language. So we have to be very careful and these people are using the great science of genetics to further their lies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shastri. We, uh, we will come back to you. Right now, I have uh, Dr. Neeraj Rai, who is uh, an expert in genetics. And uh, those of you who keep up to date might have noticed that only, a f only, a, only last month, he had a conference uh, in Delhi where he brought out the empty DNA sequence to prove that the, all the Indians are indigenous. That is one point. What I would request Dr. Rai to particularly elaborate is the entire sequence of this genetics debate into the Aryan invasion theory because it has a history, the genetics debate and it began only after the uh, Aryan invasion theory proponents be started becoming uncomfortable with the archaeological and other scientific evidence emerging. So. To make it simple to the audience here, which is uh, uh, generally a lay audience and an audience of students, I would request you to please explain how we can determine or we cannot determine whether such an invasion takes place. What are the various DNAs? What is empty DNA? What is Y chromosome? what is R1A1 and what is all this, you know, because you will have to explain this jargon to um, uh, our people here. So, uh, please. Thank you, Sanjay ji. So, uh, I am not going into detail since it is a very uh, technical field. So, I will try to explain the basic things and what we are doing. So, I will start quoting uh, uh, with मैं अभी इसको हिंदी में एक्सप्लेन करूंगा इससे एक कहावत है कि कोस कोस पे पानी बदले चार कोस पे वाणी तो जो हमारा जो इंडियन सिविलाइजेशन है इंडियन जेनेटिक मेकअप है वो एक्सट्रीमली डाइवर्स है जैसा कि अभिजीत जी ने बोला कि हम यहां की जो डाइवर्सिटी है पूरे वर्ल्ड में इतनी डाइवर्सिटी आपको कहीं नहीं मिलेगी लैंग्वेज में डाइवर्सिटी है यहां के जो लोग हैं उनके जो कल्चरल डाइवर्सिटी आपको मिलेगी और आपको पता होना चाहिए कि यहाँ हिंदुस्तान में मोर देन 5000 लैंग्वेज ग्रुप्स हैं और जो है लिंग्विस्टिक ग्रुप्स है मोस्टली जो चार है बट अगर आप उसको डिटले में जाएंगे तो आपको कम से कम जो है 10 या 12 मेजर लैंग्वेज फैमिली मिलेगी जो कि अभी इस पे काम चल रहा है इसको 
मैं स्टार्ट करूंगा कि जो ह्यूमन माइग्रेशन है वो कैसे स्टार्ट हुआ और सबसे ओल्डेस्ट जो माइग्रेशन रूट किया है अफ्रीका से जो है माइग्रेशन स्टार्ट हुआ है अबाउट सेवेंटी थाउजेंड ईयर्स बिफोर प्रेजेंट तो जितने भी यहाँ पे अर्थ पे जितने भी ह्यूमन पॉपुलेशन है ये सारे के सारे अफ्रीका से ही इवॉल्व हुए और ओवर द कोर्स ऑफ टाइम ये डिफरेंट डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड पे वो पहुँच गए और सबसे जो ओल्डेस्ट वेव ऑफ माइग्रेशन था अफ्रीका से वो टूवर्ड्स द साउथ ऑफ एशिया तो हिंदुस्तान में ऐसा नहीं है कि हम पाँच हजार सालों से ही रह रहे हैं यहाँ पे साठ हजार सालों से इंसान हैं ठीक है और बट बात जो होती है वो होती है कि जो सिविलाइजेशन सिविलाइजेशन कितना पुराना हमारा है तो अगर हम जाएंगे जो हिंदुस्तान का जो सिविलाइजेशन है वो कम से कम जो है सात से आठ हजार साल पुराना है उसको हम लोग जेनेटिकली प्रूव कर रहे हैं ये भी प्रूवेन नहीं है इसमें हम लोग काम कर रहे हैं अब हम बात करेंगे उसकी जो हम लोगों ने ऑलरेडी प्रूव किया है तो इस पे काम करने के लिए हमें जो है हम लोग डीएनए का लेते हैं सारा डीएनए जेनेटिक एविडेंस और दूसरा होता है आर्कियोलॉजिकल एविडेंस तीसरा होता है लिंग्विस्टिक एविडेंस तो आ, पहले मैं स्टार्ट करूंगा कि जो सबसे ओल्डेस्ट सिविलाइजेशन क्या थी यहाँ पे उसको बोलते हैं कि सिंधु सरस्वती सभ्यता है सबसे ओल्डेस्ट सिविलाइजेशन मानते हैं पूरे वर्ल्ड की और जो उसका डेट है जैसे कि बिरहाना आपने बताया संजय सर बिरहाना जो साइट है सात से आठ हजार साल पुराना साइट है और वहाँ पे आर्कियोलॉजिकली हमें मिलता है वेल स्टैब्लिश सिविलाइजेशन आठ हजार साल पहले पूरी दुनिया में अब कहीं पर भी इतना स्टैब्लिश सिविलाइजेशन नहीं मिलेगा अब हम बात करेंगे कि जो जो मैच्योर जो सबसे जो फ्लरिस्ट सिविलाइजेशन का जो टाइम पीरियड क्या है वो कम से कम है चार हजार बी का वर्ड नहीं यूज करना चाहिए हम बात करेंगे कम से कम छः साल पुराना उसके जो हमें प्रमाण मिलते हैं हरियाणा से राजस्थान से गुजरात से हमने 2014 में एक काम स्टार्ट किया एक आर्कियोलॉजिकल एक्सकेवेशन हुआ था राखी गढ़ी जो कि सबसे बड़ा जो सिविलाइजेशन है सबसे बड़ा जो हड़प्पन सिविलाइजेशन को बोलते हैं ये जो सिविलाइजेशन है ये मोहनजोदारों से भी बड़ा है और जो इसका जो साइज है वो मोर देन सिक्स हंड्रेड में फैला हुआ है ये जो इतना पुराना शहर है यहाँ से 2014 में जो खुदाइयाँ हुई थी उसमें बहुत सारे ह्यूमन स्केल्टन मिले थे तो इसके पहले जो आर्कोलॉजिस्ट एक्सकेवेशन करते थे वो मोस्टली काम करते थे पॉटरीज पे बीट्स पे कल्चरल मटेरियल्स पे बट हमने जो है विद द एडवेंट ऑफ डीएनए टेक्नोलॉजी हमारे हमारे पास बहुत अच्छी अपॉर्चुनिटी थी कि हम उसके जो है डी को एक्सट्रैक्ट कर सकें वहाँ के जो ह्यूमन जो बॉडी मिली थी तो ह्यूमन बॉडी से डीएनए एक्सट्रैक्ट करना एक बहुत ही टीडियस जॉब है क्योंकि जो मॉडर्न डी तो ठीक है बट इतने सारे पुराने जो अस्थियाँ मिलती हैं उससे डीएनए को निकालना बहुत बड़ा जो है डिफ़िकल्ट टास्क था फिर हमने इस पर कोशिश की और हमें दो से तीन साल लगे इसको डीएनए को एक्सट्रैक्ट करके सीक्वेंस करने में तो आपको पता है कि हमारे शरीर में तीन तरह के डीएनए होते हैं एक जो डीएनए होता है जो मदर से जाता है सारे बच्चों में जिसको बोलते हैं माइक्रोकॉन्ड्रियल डी दूसरा होता है फादर से जाता है सन में जिसको बोलते हैं वाई क्रोमोजोमल डी और तीसरा होता है न्यूक्लियर डी जो कि फिफ्टी आता है मदर से एंड फिफ्टी परसेंट आता है फादर के साइड से तो हमने जो है तीन तीनों तरह के जो डीएनए को हमने सीक्वेंस किया डी किया और डी करने से जो है फिर हमने इसको कंपेरिजन के लिए भी हमें डेटा होना चाहिए हम किससे कंपेयर करेंगे साढ़े चार हज़ार साल पुराने अगर हम सैंपल्स का डीएनए निकाल रहे हैं तो हमें जो है उसके जो कंपेयर करने के लिए भी उतने पुराने सैंपल होने चाहिए उतने पुराने सैंपल्स तो हिंदुस्तान में थे नहीं फिर हमने क्या किया कि जो मिडिल ईस्ट के जो सैंपल्स हैं सेंट्रल एशिया के सैंपल्स हैं यूरोपियन पॉपुलेशन है उससे हमने कंपेयर किया और जो आज के जो मॉडर्न इंडियन सैंपल्स हैं उनसे भी हमने कंपेयर किया हमें उसमें से उस जो डीएनए का जो फाइंडिंग्स था उसमें हमने तीन कंक्लूजन निकाले ये तीन कंक्लूजन ऐसे कंक्लूजन थे जिसको हम ऐसा नहीं बोल सकते कि मोस्ट लाइकली या जो प्रोबेबली ये हंड्रेड फुल प्रूफ फाइंडिंग था फुल प्रूफ कंक्लूजन और जो हमारा जो पेपर था वो वर्ल्ड के टॉप वन ऑफ द टॉप जर्नल में पब्लिश हुआ आपको पता होना चाहिए कि जो है बहुत सारे साइंटिफिक जर्नल्स होते हैं जो इस तरह के रिसर्च को एक्सेप्ट करते हैं वो उसका प्रॉपर रिव्यू होता है रिव्यू भी यूरोपियन ही करते हैं यूरोपियन अमेरिकन ही करते हैं तो ये इस द ये जो पेपर है वो वन ऑफ द बेस्ट पेपर ऑफ द सेंचुरी इसको आप बोल सकते हैं इंडिया में और पूरे वर्ल्ड में भी और पूरे विश्व में भी इस पेपर को इस साल का सबसे बड़े पेपर के रूप में दिखा जा रहा है तो यूरोपियंस तो पूरे के पूरे जो है अग्री हैं हमारे फाइंडिंग से अब हम बताएंगे जो फाइंडिंग क्या थी हमने 60 जो ह्यूमन स्केलेटन्स थे उससे डीएनए निकाले उसमें से जो सारे तो काम नहीं किए सिर्फ एक सैंपल ही बहुत अच्छे से काम किया बट एक सैंपल भी काफ़ी होता है एक अगर आपके पास डेटा ज़्यादा है तो 
उसमें से हमें तीन चीज़ें चीज़ पता एक तो थी कि उस समय के जो लोग थे वो जो है इंडिजिनस थे अब इंडिजिनस थे कौन थे इंडिजिनस थे क्या वो ईरानियन जो लोग थे उनसे उनकी कोई अफिनिटी थी या सेंट्रल एशियंस कोई अफिनिटी थी तो हमें चला पता कि जो यहाँ के जो ट्राइबल पॉपुलेशन है उस समय तो कास्ट का फॉर्मेशन नहीं हुआ था जो कास्ट फॉर्मेशन इंडिया में है वो जाता है चार हजार दो सौ साल पुराना जैसा कि आपके वेदों में भी वर्णन किया गया है कि जो कास्ट का जो फॉर्मेशन हुआ था वो उसी टाइम पे हुआ रहा होगा हमने जब कंपेयर किया तो जो वहाँ के जो लोग थे वो इंडिजिनस पॉपुलेशन थी उसमें सेंट्रल एशिया का कोई भी कंपोनेंट नहीं था अब आप जब जाएंगे राखी गढ़ी में तो राखी गढ़ी आपको जाना चाहिए जो कि एक बहुत अच्छी बहुत अच्छा आर्कोलॉजिकल साइट है वहाँ का जो सभ्यता जो वहाँ कल्चरल मटेरियल है सच रिच कल्चरल मटेरियल आप वहाँ पे देखिए सैनिटेशन सिस्टम जो बिल्डिंग्स थे जो ब्रिक्स थे आपको दो ब्रिक्स में जो है वन मिलीमीटर का डिफरेंस नहीं मिलेगा तो सच टेक्नोलॉजी ऐसी जो एडवांस टेक्नोलॉजी थी जो ब्रिक्स बनाते थे और वहाँ पर आपको वर्ल्ड के सबसे जो प्रीसेस बीट्स हैं जो आज के लोग बोलते हैं कि मेडिट्रेनियन में जो बीट्स हैं वो सबसे प्रीसेस हैं उससे भी प्रीसेस बीट्स वहाँ का आपको मिलेगी बीट्स टेक्नोलॉजी थी मेटालॉजिकल साइट्स थी वहाँ पे मेटालॉजी का एडवांस आपको मेडिकल साइट्स मिलेंगी और हमें वहाँ पे जो है एग्रीकल्चर के बहुत सारे प्रमाण मिलते हैं वहाँ पर हमें राइस मिला वहाँ पर हमें जो है बहुत सारे मिलेट्स मिले एग्रीकल्चर की नॉलेज थी फिर हमने जो जो दूसरी जो फाइंडिंग थी कि जो एग्रीकल्चर सिस्टम था हमारा इंडिजिनस था ऐसा अभी तक लोग मानते हैं सारे टेक्स्ट बुक में आपको मिलेगा कि जो इंडिया में एग्रीकल्चर जो लाए थे वो नियोलिथिक ईरानियंस लाए थे ईरानियंस जो है यहाँ पे आए थे साढ़े चार हज़ार साल पहले और वो एग्रीकल्चर को लेकर आए थे ये जो फाइंडिंग जो हमने हमारी थी उसमें हमने प्रूफ किया है कि एग्रीकल्चर जो है इंडिजिनस था क्योंकि ईरानियन न्यूलिथिक से हमारा कोई मिक्सिंग इवेंट था ही नहीं अगर एग्रीकल्चर अगर ईरान से आया होता ईरान के लोग आए होते तो वहाँ के लोगों से मिक्स हुए होते लेकिन हमारा उनमें कोई भी जेनेटिक सिग्नल नहीं मिल रहा है तो बहुत लोगों ने इस पर आर्गूमेंट किया नहीं ठीक है ईरानियंस लाए थे एग्रीकल्चर यहाँ पे करके वापस चले गए इस तरह के जो आर्गूमेंट्स आ रहे हैं लोगों के तो ऐसे आर्गूमेंट्स पे हम लोग को उस पर जवाब नहीं दे पाएंगे तीसरा जो हमारा जो फाइंडिंग थी वो था आउट ऑफ इंडिया माइग्रेशन इस पर बहुत दिनों से बात चल रही है कि इंडिया से लोग बाहर गए थे इसको हमने जेनेटिकली प्रूव किया है हमारे पास डेटा था तुर्कमिस्तान में एक साइट है जिसको बोलते हैं गोनूर वो कंटेम्प्रोरी टू हड़प्पन हड़प्पा था अबाउट साढ़े चार हज़ार साल पुराना वो साइट था वहाँ का भी डीएनए डेटा अवेलेबल था और एक साइट था सहारे सोक्ता जो कि ईरान में है उसी टाइम पीरियड के जो सैंपल्स थे वो जब उनका जब डेटा हमने कंपेयर किया तो चला पता कि जो वहाँ के जो लोग थे ट्वेंटी परसेंट जो वहाँ के जो लोग थे वो आउटलायर्स उन्होंने बोला ये आउटलायर्स हैं इनकी कोई जेनेटिक एफिनिटी किसी भी पॉपुलेशन से मैच नहीं कर रही है जब राखी गढ़ी का जब डेटा आया हमने जब कंपेयर कराया तो पूरी की पूरी जो है जेनेटिक जो है मैचिंग हुई और फिर हमने ये भी देखा कि जो वहाँ के लोग थे ये इंडस वैली से ही गए थे ये भी हंड्रेड फुल प्रूफ फाइंडिंग है तो अब जो हम जो बात करेंगे आर्यन इन्वेजन थियरी की बात नहीं करेंगे अब हम बात करेंगे आउट ऑफ इंडिया माइग्रेशन थियरी की और आउट ऑफ इंडिया माइग्रेशन थियरी को यूरोपियंस स्कॉलर्स हैं यूरोपियन स्कॉलर्स उसको उसको एक्सेप्ट कर रहे हैं हैप्पीली एक्सेप्ट कर रहे हैं वो मान रहे हैं कि जो है इतिहास में बहुत बड़ी गलती हुई है उसको हमें दोहराना चाहिए सबसे बड़ी दुर्भाग्य की बात है कि हमारे हिंदुस्तान में लोग बहुत सारे ऐसे जो लोग हैं ऐसे विचारधारा के लोग हैं जो इस पर आर्गूमेंट कर रहे हैं जैसा कि मैंने बताया कि ईरान से लोग आए थे फार्मिंग करके वापस चले गए तो इस तरह की जो 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 मेजर तीन फाइंडिंग्स हैं फिर हमने जो है क्या किया कि जितनी भी जो जेनेटिक फाइंडिंग्स थी जिन्होंने बोला था कि आर एन इन्वेजन हुआ था अबाउट 1500 टू 2500 फाइव हंड्रेड लाइक बिफोर क्राइस्ट वो जो डेटा था काफ़ी लिमिटेड डेटा था आप बताइए 1.3 बिलियन जो इंडियन पॉपुलेशन है अगर आप 50 लोगों का सैंपल लेकर के अगर आप एक हाइपोथेसिस देते हैं कि uh, एक सेंट्रल एशियन जीन पुल मिल रहा है जिसको बोलते हैं स्टेपी जीन्स तो वो जो है लॉजिकल नहीं होगा हमने 10,000 सैंपलिंग की 10,000 लोगों का सैंपल लिया जिसमें कि 500 डिफरेंट जो है कम्युनिटी के लोग हैं और डिफरेंट डिफरेंट जोग्राफिकल रीजन के हमने उनका जो वाई क्रोमोसोमल डीएनए जो कि फादर से आता है सन में वो डीएनए को सीक्वेंस किया फिर हमने देखा जो बोलते हैं कि जो वेस्टर्न स्कॉलर्स बोलते हैं कि आर ए जीन आर ए जीन जो है बाहर से आया यूरोप में और इंडिया में जो फोर्टी लोगों में वो जीन है वो जीन बाहर से आया तो जेनेटिक्स में एक रूल होता है कि जहाँ पर जितनी डाइवर्सिटी होती है जितनी डाइवर्सिटी होगी जो उसके और जो ओरिजिन होगा वहीं पे होगा हमें आर वन ए की जो डाइवर्सिटी है इंडिया में वो मोर देन 60 परसेंट देन यूरोपियन डाइवर्सिटी मिल रही है और हम उसको पूरा का पूरा 
मैप के हिसाब से बता रहे हैं कैसे कैसे माइग्रेशन हुआ यहाँ से और ये जो ब्रांच था यहाँ से जो लोग यूरोप गए थे वो लेके गए तो ये भी एक बहुत बड़ा जो हम लोगों का ब्रेक थ्रू पेपर आने वाला है जिसमें प्रूव कर रहे हैं कि आउट ऑफ इंडिया जो माइग्रेशन थियरी है सही है लेकिन एट द सेम टाइम बींग साइंटिस्ट मैं बताना चाहूँगा कि ऐसा नहीं है कि जो है मिक्सिंग नहीं हुई वहाँ से लोग कुछ आए वो आए डिफरेंट डिफरेंट पीरियड्स में आए हमें उनके सिग्नल्स मिलते हैं यहाँ पे जो कि 1200 सौ बी में 600 सौ बी में 800 सौ बिफोर क्राइस्ट के टाइम पे मिलता है हमें मिक्सिंग हुई थी वैसे ही जो है इंडिया से भी वहाँ के लोग गए हमें हमारा एक पेपर है जिसमें कि मैं उसमें मेन ऑथर हूँ हमने जो है प्रूफ किया है कि जितने भी रोमानी पॉपुलेशन है जिप्सी पॉपुलेशन जो यूरोप में है वो इंडिया से गए लेकिन दुर्भाग्य देखिए कि जो भी पॉपुलेशन जो बाहर से आई हमने उनको एक्सेप्ट किया जैसे कि पारसी पारसी पर मैंने काम किया है वहाँ के जो पारसी के जो बोन्स मिले थे गुजरात में एक जगह संजान हमने उसको डेट किया उसका डेट गया 700 सौ मतलब आज के तेरह सौ साल पहले जो है पारसी आए इंडिया में और यहाँ के लोगों से मिक्स हुए कल्चरली फुल्ली एसिमुलेट हो गए यहाँ के पॉपुलेशन से और हमें उनका जो है जेनेटिक सिंबल्स मिलता है गुजराती पॉपुलेशन में जैसे जूस जूस यहाँ पे आए तीसरी आ, आ, तीसरी शताब्दी और थर्ड फोर्थ सेंचुरी एडी में जूस यहाँ इंडिया में आए और कल्चरली पूरा यहाँ पर मिक्स हो गया अच्छे से उनका जेनेटिक सिंगल मिलता है यहाँ के लोगों में वैसे ही यहाँ के लोग भी वहाँ गए बट अभी भी जो जिप्सी पॉपुलेशन है या जो रोमानी पॉपुलेशन है जो यूरोप में वो वहाँ के लोगों ने अभी तक उनको एक्सेप्ट नहीं किया है तो इंडिया का ऐसा कल्चर रहा है कि जो भी पॉपुलेशन यहाँ पे आई है उनको हमने वहाँ पे एक्सेप्ट किया बट अगर इन्वेट करके आए तब नहीं जैसे हुन सा है हुन यहाँ पर इन्वेट करने आए बट यहाँ से उनको वापस जाना पड़ा तो ये हमारा ब्यूटी है हमारा जो संस्कृति है इंडिया की तो ये जो हमारा जो फोर फाइंडिंग्स है और हमने हमें बहुत सारे ऐसे भी एविडेंसेस मिल रहे हैं जैसे कि हॉर्स का हमें एक जैसा बोलते हैं कि जो हॉर्स है वो जो है यूरोपियंस लेके आए हमें ऐसे बहुत सारे एविडेंसेस मिल रहे हैं कि हॉर्स जो है यहीं का था बट नॉट अरबिन हॉर्स इट्स अ पोनी हॉर्स हमने उसको जेनेटिकली इसको देखा है पोनी हॉर्स जो कि आप वहाँ मिलता है हिमालय में मिलता है इसी के साथ मैं क्वेश्चंस uh, लेना पसंद करूंगा क्योंकि जो बहुत सारे लोगों में बहुत सारे तरह तरह की विभिन्नताएं हैं और uh, ये बहुत ऐसे टॉपिक है कि बहुत लोगों को समझ में नहीं आता है तो अगर कोई क्वेश्चन होगा तो मैं उसको लेना ज़्यादा पसंद करूंगा थैंक यू बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नीरज जी एक बड़ी डिफिकल्ट सब्जेक्ट को आपने बहुत ही आसानी से यहाँ एक्सप्लेन किया क्वेश्चन uh, नहीं आ पा रहे मेरे पास आप लोग मेसमराइज हो गए हैं या समझ में नहीं आ रहा है तो इसलिए कृपया क्वेश्चंस इस बार तो तीन प्राइजेस मिलनी है नहीं तो मैं उसको अगर क्वेश्चंस नहीं आएंगे तो घटा दूंगा एक कर दूंगा लॉर्ड ऑफ क्वेश्चंस थैंक यू दिस इज दिस क्वेश्चन ऑफ दर्टी फोर रिब्स एंड थर्टी सिक्स रिब्स हॉर्स ये क्या है कि साहब सेंट्रल एशियन हॉर्स जो था या जैसा वो कि छत्तीस रिप्स का था और हमारा हॉर्स चौंतीस रिप्स का था और यहाँ छत्तीस रिप्स का कोई अवशेष मिलता नहीं है पुराना मोस्ट uh, लाइकली uh, जो पोनी हॉर्स है दैट इज थर्टी फोर रिप्स हॉर्स बट उस पर हम लोग काम कर रहे हैं और uh, जैसा कि मैंने बोला जो भी मैं यहाँ बोला हूँ इस मंच से जो हंड्रेड परसेंट ऑथेंटिक है मैं वही बोला हूँ थर्टी फोर रिप्स के हमें एविडेंसेस मिल रहे हैं बट फुल प्रूफ नहीं है क्योंकि न्यूक्लियर डी uh, बहुत डिफिकल्टी से एक्सट्रैक्ट होते हैं कंपेयर दैन माइट्रोकॉनल डी एन ए तो माइट्रोकॉनल डी एन ए से प्रूफ नहीं होगा थर्टी फोर रिप्स बट उस पर सर काम कर रहे हैं जल्दी उस पर उसका भी रिजल्ट आएगा बेस्ट लक डॉक्टर फ्रॉली थ्रो दिस क्वेश्चन टू यू विद दिस माउंटिंग एविडेंस ऑफ द लाइकली और मे बी ऑलरेडी हैपन डिमाइज ऑफ द आर एन इन्वेजन थियरी How does the biblical chronology get affected? Because uh, the entire fabrication of the Aryan invasion theory was basically to preserve the biblical chronology in which the, I think the Earth was created on 22nd or 23rd February 4004 BC. I think 23rd. Um, आप लोगों को किसी ध्यान है क्या आई थिंक इट वॉज ट्वेंटी सेकेंड और ट्वेंटी थर्ड फेब्रवरी फोर थाउजेंड फोर बी सी दैट दी अर्थ वॉज क्रिएटेड नोआज फ्लड वॉज थ्री थाउजेंड बी सी एंड इट इज बिकॉज ऑफ दीज एक्शियम्स 
just like the axioms that uh, Dr. Raju was referring to yesterday. Because of these axioms, no civilization can happen before 1500 BC. QED. How do you like that proof? Sir. Uh, yes. I would actually want to take this to a bit broader level. Obviously, the Darwin and everything has uh, erased that idea of human beings being 5,000, 6,000 years old. But what the biblical chronology continued was the idea that civilization began in Middle East Mesopotamia, and there it went to Europe, and India was kind of left out in the corner, not particularly important. And the Aryan invasion theory served to make it so India had no civilization of its own, so it was no longer competing as a civilizational model. So what this new information and the demise of the Aryan invasion migration theory shows is that India has a largely indigenous civilization. It is the oldest and most continuous civilization in the world cradle of civilization, we could say, and the biblical Middle Eastern region is kind of a small area in the desert. Sumeria, their so-called cradle of civilization, wouldn't even fit into Surat, it wouldn't even fit into part of Gujarat, it's so small. So what this information does, it destroys the whole model of civilization coming out of the Western world and their whole idea of history coming largely from the Middle East and then the Europeans developing that civilization and India getting something indirectly from the Europeans. So in other words, it is the biggest revolution in our study of history to date it requires the rewriting of all of ancient history, and it requires honoring the civilization of India. And in the Indian context, all these people who say there was no civilization of India or Bharat was all outside invaders. We now show an enduring population, an enduring uh, literature, an enduring many-sided vast culture, of course, but it puts India at the center of the past and possibly the future evolution of humanity. Thank you. And um, next question I ask um, Arvindan, what happens to the Dravidian Christianity and the Lemurians? See, essentially the Lemurian myth is something that comes from theosophical society, from theosophy, that there was this big, uh, huge connecting intercontinent that uh, went inside and it was the original land of uh, the Tamil race. It doesn't have any uh, basis in science and uh, what happens when the Aryan invasion theory dies, there are, I, I see two possibilities. One is the truth should be accepted. And another possibility, and that is what is going to happen most probably, is that they are going to reassert again and again that we have a separate identity, that we are different from the North Indian people, and we have, we are our own, uh, we form a linguistic nation of our own. The Aryan invasion theory basically is aimed at not the past. It is aimed at how to divide Indians and Hindus in the present. Create evangelical capital out of the different deepened default, uh, fault lines. So, once this Aryan framework has been given, Aryan, non-Aryan framework has been given, already it has gone deep into all the fields in social sciences in India. So, you talk about Nagas, Nagas are non-Aryan people. You can see that in all sociological journals. You talk about the high traditions and low traditions and low traditions, the so-called low traditions are non-Aryan and the so-called high traditions are Aryan. In Ayurveda, I am talking about Ayurveda, in Ayurveda it is said that non-Aryan tribal people had the knowledge of herbs and this was taken by the Brahmin Vaidyas who never worked in the field. So this has actually gone into everything in the social sciences. Now this should be exercised, actually. 
the whole thing has to be exercised. And for that, the most important thing that we have to do is, we have to get it into the textbooks. If we are not doing that, and it is not now that Aryan invasion theory has been falsified. For example, when Mortimer Wheeler said about uh, Indra stands accused for the massacre of the Indus Valley people, George Dales proved it was not so, Bibilal proved it was not so, that happened in 1970s. But Mortimer Wheeler gets quoted in all the textbooks till 2005, not George Dales or Bibila. So we have to get these discoveries into the textbooks as fast as possible if we want to destroy the Dravidian uh, or for that matter the racist theories that are in work in India. Uh, I think the, um, this Aryan invasion theory and the built up on that was greatly invested into by uh, Bishop Caldwell and uh, his successors. How would that be impacted? See, that they have made a very great investment, a very big investment in this. Now, I will give you one example of how this operates. You have two Ramayanas in Tamil Nadu, as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, Valmiki Ramayana, Kamba Ramayana. What they say, this uh, Caldwell like missionaries, what they say is Kamba Ramayana is li has in terms of uh, literary value and in terms of ethical value is superior to Valmiki Ramayana. Now, the linguistic ego gets massaged. You accept that very easily. So any Tamil would accept telling that Kamban is superior to Valmiki. But the next, then comes the twist. It is because of the Dravidian value system that was here. Then comes the next twist. This Dravidian value system, how it comes? It comes from St. Thomas. So essentially, Kamba Ramayana itself has been influenced by Christianity basically. So this is the kind of uh, investment scholarship, this kind of things has got PhD in Madras University. Yes. I, so, I this is the kind of investment that oh, is there. How do you dismantle it? You cannot dismantle it in Tamil Nadu because you have created political vested interest out of it. From the ordinary councillor to the chief minister, everybody has got ideological vested interest in Dravidian ideology. So, Simultaneously, you have to fight the battle, the level of scientific journals, the level of uh, uh, political will, the level of education, everything, you have to fight. And I will give you another one example how it is getting worked. The whole genetic story started with the Bamshed et al. paper in 2001. When Bamshed et al. paper said that the caste system has a very clear racial component to it. The same year, the it was published, there was a human rights conference, UN human rights conference in South Africa, that they said caste is equal to race, so India is an apartheid nation, so economic sanction should be levied against India. So this is the kind of game that is happening around. And to fight it, we have to work at various levels, and we have to take these discoveries to the people. That is the most important thing. Avijit, um, uh, you want to say something? Yes. yes. I, I just want to make a comment about uh, this business of Aryan and Dravidian. Now, once you know that Aryan is fake, where, did, where does Dravidian come from? Basically, it came when they started saying that these are Aryan languages. They found some people with slightly different languages in the south, and they made them into a Dravidian race. There is no Dravidian race, but unfortunately, the terminology is such that now everybody talks about Dravidian languages personally, I am against, I mean, I am the single person maybe, I can't fight against it, but I'll say it. I'm against the use of the term Dravidian language. They are South Indian languages. And a thing that is forgotten is, see, as a South Indian myself, born uh, and you know, now living in Karnataka, you know, the people who speak Tamil, Tamil, as I should say, are very assertive and a, and a proud people. But they are not the only South Indian language speakers. And somehow, in most of India, they sort of conflate the South with Tamil. Actually, South India has uh, Telugu, Kannada, it's not Kannada, it's Kannada, Malayalam, and Tamil. You have four different languages. These languages are all very, very closely interlinked with Sanskrit. 
if those philologists had not been racists, they would have been able to look at these languages more objectively and realize that these languages have been together for a very long time. But the first breaking India force was to say that these people are Aryans, those people are Dravidians. And now you have Dravidian this, Dravidian that, Lemurian this, Dravidian political parties. I think this is something that needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. Avjit, how do you look at the pushback that is going to happen? How do you look at the pushback that is uh, inevitable? Pushback is inevitable. They're going to keep on fighting because they are heavily invested in this. They're going to find something new. They're going to f they're going to twist the reports. I mean, look at Tony Joseph. Right. I, I know. I mean, he's the entire me science of genetics. He's blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> oh, he's blocked you, is he? Yes. I see. It. I mean, genetics tells you that there is no such thing as an Aryan race and a Dravidian race. It clearly shows that, and still they go. They keep on harping about this, and. Even after the Rakhigari paper came out, Tony Joseph went on Twitter on a long rant trying to interpret the Rakhigari findings as a validation of the Aryan invasion or migration theory. So the thing is that they are not concerned about facts. They are not interested in the truth. It's only all about propaganda. As long as they can influence people's opinions, they don't care. That's what it is. Well, so we're going to have to keep on finding. This, finding. Is, this is a post-modernist world. It facts, is. It facts is. Facts don't matter. Facts don't matter. It's the post-truth world, isn't it? <laughs> facts don't matter anymore. It's all about propaganda. So we're going to have to keep on fighting. We're going to have to keep on communicating with the people. We, like Arvindan ji said, we have to communicate the latest findings and what they mean. Don't communicate in scientific terminology and jargon, but tell the people what actually it means for them. Right. So that's what needs to happen. And we're going to have to keep on fight, fighting inch by inch, mile by mile, trench by trench. We have to keep on going. But the truth will prevail because eventually people will come to know what, it, what, what the truth is. The thing is that it should not be too late. That's all. One of the things that they are doing is they're saying that until we've totally agreed upon the new model, we'll keep the old model there. <laughs> and so the, the, the road is hard for us and um, well the Aryan invasion theory has been propounded without any basis and therefore I have decided to increase uh, the price from rupees 1 crore to rupees 2 crore. So all those who are leaving please, please sit down and listen to this. Now you can get 2 crores for proving the Aryan invasion theory correct. Um, shall I take questions or? Yes, please. Uh, of course, I was very honored to uh, meet uh, Dr. Neeraj Rai and, and discuss a few things with him, with him because uh, by coincidence, I spent the last one month reading about and summarizing about, about 45 genetics papers in, because I'm writing something. I'm actually writing a book about the Aryan invasion theory. Now, unfortunately, even in the genetics community, there is, uh, you know, there is this, uh, this move to sort of divide India up. And some years ago, a very uh, famous man who's written a book, whose book I've not read, of course, called Reich or Reich, who's written, a, you know, who, he did a genetic study where he divided Indians up in, into ASI, ancestral South Indian, and ANI, ancestral North Indian as though there are two separate groups. And there's a kind of insinuation that ancestral North Indian genes are for North Indians and Sanskrit speakers, speakers of Marathi, Gujarati, Hindi, Bengali. And ancestral South Indian is somehow, you know, this Tamil mainly and, you know, South Indian, like Dravidian languages. And actually, the problem is when, when a genetics paper writes this, everybody believes it. And everybody, it's very easy for a man like Tony Joseph to say that this is true. But if you actually take this man Reich's paper, and I've, I've done that, and I've actually published it somewhere in some online journal, online paper. If you look at the proportions of this ancestral North Indian and ancestral South Indian, it's almost exactly the same throughout India, whichever part of India you take, and whether you take tribals, castes, uh, you know, upper caste, forward caste, low, uh, backward caste, whatever, it's approximately 40% to 60%. 
Yes, there are some outliers. There are some people with very high, 70% uh, ancestral North Indian. Those are Kashmiri Pandits and Pathans. But if you leave those outliers out, the Indian mix is very, very, that means the fact is even the Pathans and Kashmiri Pandits have 30% ancestral South Indian. The rest of them are all mixed up together. Of course, the reason uh, uh, it was very nice to talk to Dr. Neeraj Rai was, in fact, even this ASI, ANI is now being discarded. The newer generation of young geneticists who I'm very happy to meet are now just tearing down all this nonsense. And I hope you people will be able to follow it up and not fall for the propaganda that comes about breaking India. Thank you. Now I'll take questions. Uh, will somebody from the management committee advise those who are outsiders and who have given questions that uh, if they are not present here, their questions will be passed over. So let them all come in, please. Uh, the first question is to Dr. Frawley from Mr. Anil Dhawan. Is he here? Okay, Mr. Anil Dhawan is here. Uh, the first question has already been discussed, so that uh, he's given two questions. So I'm not going to take that. The second one is uh, about the calendar reform committee. The calendar reform, the calendar reform committee. Uh, I think you're talking about the Gregorian calendar. The the one which uh, of of India. Yeah, it's not clear here. The calendar reform committee fixed an imaginary point as base for zero anonch year to appease the historians of West and degrade the Indian timeline starting from 3102 BC is written 3202, it is 3102. Uh, sir, I think you are just the right person for this. Well, what you are talking about is the relative to the Panchanga and relative to the zero point of what we call the sidereal uh, zodiac, which is a point in the sky that has, there's been some debate as to exactly where it is. The point of zero Aries, or opposite that, Chitra, point of zero Libra. And the variations are only two, three degrees that are being uh, disputed. But it changes some of the dates of the calendars by a few hundred years, or it also changes a few dates in the uh, Panjanga. So that is a kind of a technical astronomical issue. And because it's not exact, then they tend to doubt whether anything else in India uh, was exact. But you have to understand that any solar lunar calendar is going to have some variations because it's an organic calendar based upon the sky. It's not an abstract mathematical calendar. It doesn't turn, it doesn't relate to this particular issue very much except that the creation of the uh, Kali Yuga era of 3102 BC based upon certain uh, conjunctions that can still be shown. But I would say the greater point is that there is a lot of astronomical data in Vedic text talking about various equinoxes and solstices and even in later texts like Shatapata Brahmana you have a Kritika equinox, and even at a Tarva Veda, Kritika begins, Kritika is a Pleiades Taurus, and you have the Ayana or solstice in uh, Maga, which is Leo. That's easily a date of more than 2500 BC. So we do find these ancient calendars. They have been dismissed by Western historians, and some of them say, some of them said the racist thing that Hindus aren't very good at astronomy now. We can't believe they were very good at astronomy then. But the fact is there is the oldest astronomy and mathematics in the Vedic text, just as there is a lot of this other sophistication that I talked about. The next question is from Mr. Amitabh Hirawat. Mr. Hirawat. Uh, this is to uh, Mr. Neeraj Rai. Very interesting question, that if the Aryans uh, had invaded, they, sh they should certainly have left some footprints on the route. Are there any? Uh, archaeologically and uh, culturally, we are not finding any cultural material uh, from the Central Asia in any of the archaeological sites 
whether it is mature Harappan site or late Harappan site or maybe the painted grave culture, we are not finding any such kind of traces which might have come from uh, with the Aryans, so-called Aryans. Thank you. Next question is from Akshita Jangir. Are you here, Akshita? So I'll I'll pass this over and once they come back I'll take them. Oh, she's here. <laughs> okay. This question is again to Mr. Frawley. Is it true that this uh, Aryan invasion theory was to symbolize European supremacy in order to divide Hindus? Also, isn't Hinduism itself an import? by Aryan race since the Vedic religion has emerged? Well, I'll address that issue of the Europeans. See, originally in the 18th century, there was a lot of respect for India, particularly by French and German thinkers, like Voltaire extending to uh, Schopenhauer in the uh, 19th century and so forth. The idea of India as a great civilization but for the British colonizing India, they tried to demote everything Indian and put India on par with kind of black Africa and primitive people that they thought uh, that way. So the, the, the narrative about India became negative and the Aryan issue became, came brought in. And from the British, since they were also invaders, to have the Hindus originally being invaders was also very good for them. Uh, politically. So there was this idea of using the Aryan invasion to discredit the civilization of India and to make the European rulers look like they were enlightening the country as well. And then there came the issue of, in, of European identity. Aryan question is not Indian identity for the Europeans, it's their own identity. And the black skinned, dark skinned Indians. They wanted to be their own white skinned uh, European colonialist, and the only way they could do that was to have the Aryan invasion theory and remove the emphasis on Sanskrit to these primitive steppe people as the origin of both. Mr. Himanshu Yadav is next. Okay. You have two questions. I can take only one. Which one would you prefer? To Mr. Rai. Okay, this is a highly technical question. So, it says, uh, how does the data on admixture play out into this? Specifically, the studies of Haak and Rice, which compared different genomes, Yamnya genomes, and found uh, 30% admixture in French and significantly less in others like Sardinians. Sardinians. Uh, can you comment on the study of Muhammad Ali which found SNP variations in uh, of North and South Indians? Is OLC 224A5 the only genetic difference between the two? So you are talking about the SLC 45A2 gene. This is, the, this is for the skin? color. So you know the uh, gene behind the skin is a, uh, it's a bunch of genes, it's not only one gene and uh, not only SLC 45A2, there are many genes which is responsible for the skin color. Uh, people have found few SNPs which are highly, highly variable among the uh, Caucasians, Indians and Europeans. So in India, we have found like a high diversity of this polymorphism. And you know, the polymorphism is not very accurate way to understand the uh, genetic history of a trait, for example, skin. Uh, you must be shocked that all the Britishers, about 10,000 years before present, they were black. So it's all about the migrations and adaptation toward the climatic conditions. So. Uh, so uh, this SNP is like highly variable among the Indian populations and it is also variable within the caste. So in Brahmins, the polymorph, the like A alleles are more, mostly it is there in the 40-50% like A alleles. And if you go to the uh, other caste population, you will find more G alleles. But that is due to the isolations. 
because all these populations they are not mixing since last 3000 years before present so they have got this kind of isolation so this is not due to the mixing but the isolation and uh, the you have talked you, you have also mentioned about the uh, yamnia population so the, we have compared the yamnia population with the modern indian population if we we'll, if we we'll compare the yamnia yamnia like uh, the sample is about 4500 year old but we don't have much data uh, from that time period so the data was compared with the modern indian population so that admixture plot is not very accurate Uh, this question was not addressed to me, excuse me, <coughs> but I noticed the word Yamnaya was used. Now this Yamnaya word keeps on occurring in archaeological papers and Andronova and some lying anthropologists and linguists who try and connect Yamnaya culture with Aryans. Now I would like to know, I would like to ask anybody, 4,500 years ago or 3,500 or 5,000 or 8,000 or 2,000 years ago, what was the language that was spoken by the Yamnaya culture? There is no, no text, there is no tradition, there is no pottery shard, there is nothing, there is no book. There is no proof of language. If there is no proof of language in that area, how do you know that language came here and what language came here? Why do we believe this? How can we believe that a language that is completely unknown suddenly appeared? And please let me tell you, if anybody wants to say PIE, Proto-Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European is a cooked up language. Proto-Indo-European is like saying that I have a salad that is made of, you know, I first make a salad out of cucumber, tomato and carrot. And then I say this is the original, this salad is original, from this salad we get cucumbers, tomatoes and carrots. So they've used modern languages, They've made a PIE and they think PIE is the mother of all this. This is a circular argument. I mean, this is nonsense. We need to understand some of these things. I'll comment one uh, another point. So the, uh, the, the polymorphism is highly variable uh, alleles, so which is not very accurate. But what I was talking about in the case of Rakhi Gadi, we have uh, measured the ancestry gradient using the ancestry markers, which is extremely accurate and 100% proof. So the polymorphic study you will sign like hundreds of papers and uh, in the next day you will find like all the, all the uh, assumptions and hypotheses will be, uh, will be ruled out by the another paper. Now the next question is to Dr. Frawley from Ajay Sharma. Ajay Sharma ji, can you see up? Okay, thank you. Very, this is specifically to you, and this is because of one of your inventions. Saying, um, why did Hindus fail to create modern Kshatriya? Why do Hindus fail to create modern Kshatriyas? Well, I think Hindus have created modern Kshatriyas. The question is, why aren't they in positions of political power and, and even intellectual power? And I think that's because in the Neruvian era, there was the Neruvian forces captured those factors and have continued their uh, favoring their people in those uh, positions. But certainly there is the Kshatriya side to Indian culture, whether it's Gita, Ramayana, all these different things. It's not directly relevant to our particular topic today. But I think this Kshatriya spirit is coming up and it does need to be there relative to the history also. Don't let outside people who've never studied your culture, who don't know what your texts mean, interpret them for you and tell you they mean something di totally different than what you think and that they know better how to understand your traditions. And the next question is from Anukriti Sharma. Okay. Since it is not addressed to anybody in particular, I'll ask Avijit to uh, take this piece. Uh, basically, I, I'll, I'll, it's a long question, so I'll read out the essence of the question and that is, how can there be a huge gap between IVC and Janpadas? IVC, by the way, is Indus Valley Civilization. IVC and? Janpadas. There has to be a civilization in between and these Saraswati civilization as uh, she says and basically she's agreeing with us but uh, you can comment on it so what 
happens is that there are enormous gaps in Indian history. We know that the archaeological record is continuous. We don't have any gaps in the archaeological record. If we take, if we go outside this hotel and we dig a trench, we're going to find evidence of human settlement every 500 years. I mean, it's going to go, it's going to be continuous all the way down to five or 10,000 years. So human inhabitation in India has been continuous and so has Indian history. It's been continuous, but we don't have information about large portions of Indian history. For example, let me give you an example. For example, the King Vikramaditya is considered to be a legendary king. However, we have an entire era named after him, the Vikram Samvat era. So how can he be a legendary king? How can he be a mythological king? He must have existed, but we don't have any concrete evidence of his reign in India. So that's what I was talking about earlier as well, that we need to address these big chunks of big, big uh, gaps that we have in Indian history by, by doing various kinds of research, archaeological research, literary research, etc. So there are, the history has been continuous, but well, there's a, a dearth of information between the period of the IVC and the Janapadas. We don't even know the names of the cities of the IVC, for example. We call, we, there are these names of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa and Rakigari. These are modern names. We don't know what the inhabitants called these cities. So there's a huge lack of information. And that's because in the past 70 years, nobody has done any historical, historical research seriously. So that needs to be addressed now. That's the answer. Gari is in the Kuru country. It's in Kuru Kshetra. Kuru Janapada was certainly known at those times. And if you want to learn more about Rakigari, you can buy my two books there. It's full of Rakigari. The next question it is uh, Mr. Abhimanyu Rao. Okay. Mr. Abhimanyu Rao has uh, actually quoted the uh, definition of uh, Aryans from the NCERT. Aryans were the tribe of people who had to migrate at different parts of the world. Fortunately, it is migration. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Abhijit is claiming that it will soon become tourism. So they came for tourism and stayed here. The tribe of people who had to migrate at different parts of the world as life became difficult for them and they're in their original homeland. Now what he wants to know, what is NCRT doing about it? And oh, oh, let me add to that, how do we persuade NCERT to do something about it now that some hard evidence is available? Aravindan. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll come to you after. How do we persuade NCRT? Yes. Actually, you should be able to answer <laughs> that better than me because you are in the system. But essentially what we can do is… We, we did hear the Honorable Home Minister make a statement on this no, just a few days back. Yeah. What we can actually do is we can write textbooks ourselves and we can publish it. Like, for example, uh, what Vupinder Singh does. She has written this textbook on ancient Indian history. It is not recommended by NCRT or anything, but it has been published by uh, Prentice Hall, I think. It has been published. Now, after a few years, it is going to set the standard for textbooks, like Romila Thapar did. Romila Thapar published the early and medieval period history of India based on her own distortions, published it through Oxford University Press, and then that became the model for NCRT. So what we have to first do is we have to publish a book that contains the latest uh, discoveries in a language that can be that can easily communicate to the uh, both the professional and the lay person. And it has to be in a very dispassionate, objective manner. First, it has to be produced, and it has to be given. Then that will create a pressure on NCRT when you are selecting the textbooks. Right now when they are selecting the textbooks, there are only left-wing textbooks are present. 
none of uh, the real textbooks are present. Only Romila Thapar. And Upinta Singh is, of course, far better than Romila Thapar, actually. She doesn't distinguish between um, Harappan age and Vedic age. They, she considers it as a continuum. She has also included Dr. Subhash uh, uh, dates of Vedas into the textbook. And that is a really very significant victory for our side, uh, to get that included into a textbook written by Dr. Upinta Singh. But that is a very small victory, though very significant. We have a lot of work to do in terms of writing textbooks and then creating a pressure on NCRT. Shastri, you wanted to add to it? Hello? Yeah. This is a, a very important critical question. The only thing I want to mention is I know a couple of uh, independent researchers who are doing a lot of work uh, called Meg Kalyan Sundaram and Manonya Shastri. Now, this uh, pair, what they did was they found that the Aryan invasion theory was mentioned in the IAS uh, question papers in the, in the usual format that is wrong and they, they collected a lot of material to show that it is wrong they, through a series of RTIs. How they did it, I don't know. Apparently, they actually got a change and it's no longer included in the syllabus as, as true. Now, I haven't confirmed this, but this was presented at a meeting by them. And we may all have to work on this. You know, first of all, we have to convince ourselves that this is nonsense and understand that people who are working on it are not lying and then work on it in this way. And certainly, uh, what Arvind then says is correct. We need to write. And uh, another one aspect I want to tell us, when we write the textbook, we have to shift the focus from who have been adhering to the so-called Aryan invasion theory, like Airavada Magadevan, Asko Parpola, they have been using the Vedic symbolism to study the Harappan civilization. But if the same thing is done by Dr. David Frawley, they would say that this is a, a Hindutva conspiracy. The point we have to do is, we have to write a complete textbook. Not just Aryan invasion theory, complete textbook of ancient India. And that is how we create pressure. Yes, 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 certainly. I hope Mr. Ram Sharma is here and listening. Um, see, there is a very definite chronology. I, I have been in various discussions where people struggle with the idea asking, is the Harappan civilization Vedic or not? But there's some very, very definite chronology. There are scientific papers. See, first of all, now, what is the internal evidence of the Vedas? Now, the Western... Uh, Linguists keep saying there's internal evidence of the Vedas and they quote words like Dasyu, Pur, Anas and things like that. If you're going to take internal evidence of the Vedas as Dasyu, Pur and Anas, you also have to take Saraswati river. Now Saraswati river in the Vedas was flowing from mountains to see it was a mighty river. Has this been proven scientifically? It has. I can quote the papers. It has been proven that it, there was a mighty river flowing from Himalayan mountains to the sea 10,000 years ago, okay? It may have been going on for another two to 3,000 more years, but in that paper, they don't have evidence for that. Probably continued for some more time. So if you look at Vedic period, we are looking at something that was probably looking at a river 10,000 to maybe 8,000 years ago. Next, you look at what is the evidence in say, Manusmriti or Mahabharata. The river was drying up. We know there is scientific evidence of the river drying up from 6,000 years ago to about 4,000 years ago. And finally, we have the Harappan civilization that was around 5,000 years ago. So there is a chronology. And if, if you say, if you ask whether Harappan was Vedic, it may well have been. But my personal opinion was that the actual Vedas and the period came much, much earlier. This is, this is my feeling. And the only evidence I can quote is this chronological sequence, whether anybody accepts it or not is a different thing, but this is what I am looking at. Mr. Rohit Yadav, are you here? Okay. The question is addressed to me, but I think uh, Abhijit is the better person to address this. So we have Dwarka, Rakhi Gadi, etc. 7,500 to 9,000 years old sites proved by carbon dating 
then why we have to answer that Indus Valley is the first civilization of India? This is asked in every competitive exam and they have to answer according to the textbooks. Yes, so what we need to do is we need to date the site at Dwarka accurately. We have to use different methods, not just one method of carbon dating. There are other methods also, bioluminescence dating, etc. So what we need to do is we need to establish a proper time frame for when this city flourished. And, this, and similarly, we need to do the same thing for the Rama Setu. Now the thing is that carbon dating is done on organic material. And if a site has been underwater for several thousand years, then most organic material degrades and uh, so it is, so the challenge is to find or viable organic material that can be dated. And that's why other techniques of dating should also be used. Now, clearly this proves that there was a city, the, the, the same city that the Mahabharata mentions was there. So, so there's no, no question of the fact that the, the Vedic civilization and the Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization are one and the same. So we just need to do proper scientific investigations and make these facts known to the people and then everything uh, will be the way it needs to be. Thank you. Now we have some questions from the students. Are they back? Sab okay, let me, let, let, let me try it. Is Mano Punya here? Okay, good. Mano Punya is asking, so you said that Sanskrit is the, uh, this is to Dr. David Trolley. You said that this Sanskrit is the oldest in scientific language. So why Sanskrit speakers are declining in numbers? And do you have any solution for it? How do you explain that uh, there are many similar words in Russian and Sanskrit language that of course you, you already spoken but why are these speakers declining in Sanskrit and how we can address that particular situation? Well, we have to understand that the recognition of the value of Sanskrit has grown globally quite a bit and people who have know some Sanskrit words or chants, particularly in yoga circles, has also grown in numbers. In the India context, there's been less support for the Sanskrit language and Sanskrit speakers in the homeland of this language. So giving more emphasis on Sanskrit and bringing Sanskrit into the schools and Sanskrit as a unifying language for understanding the culture and civilization of India is a very important thing to do educationally along with the other changes that are necessary. Okay, next is from Chaitanya Sharma. Are you here? Chaitanya Sharma not here? Garvit? Okay, Garvit is here. So Garvit's question is addressed to Arvindan. He wants to know what are the differences between Sanskrit and Hindi. Hindi? I am not an expert on Hindi. And? So, I have to leave it at that. But I will just, can you change that question in Sanskrit and Tamil and I can answer that because… Yes, yes, I think that, that would be… A, more that, more that, relevant. That, that would definitely enlighten everybody in the audience. What are the differences between Sanskrit and Tamil? Yeah. See, many of the time our Puranas contain very core deep truths, which we often miss. The Western philologists and the linguists have been telling you that the Tamil and the Sanskrit, they belong to two different language families. And of course, language families morph to two different distinct races, and they also morph to two different distinct cultures. This kind of nonsense has gone to such an extent that they start telling that the Aryan culture is fire-based, the Dravidian culture is water-based, blah, blah. Okay. So now, I want to make you understand that the South Indian, the, one of the oldest languages of South India, let us say Tamil, 
and take Sanskrit. And let us see whether they are really different. Now, the Puranas, in Tamil Nadu particularly, there is a Purana that says both the grammar for Sanskrit and Tamil came from the two sides of the Damaru of Shiva. Okay. This shows that they belong to a deeper super family of languages, which diverged later within India. Nobody came from outside. You know what is Dharma, right? You know what is Dharma? When I ask you Dharma, you understand what is Dharma. If you are going to a Tamil person and he, you tell him, do you know Dharma? He will understand Dharma. He will translate Dharma to a Tamil word called Aram. Okay, Aram. The root of this word Aram is Ar. Which in turn is the root for Rita. Right? Okay. Now, if you are telling, so the Tamil doesn't have any problem when you tell him Dharma. He will, he has a term for it, Aram, which in turn, whose roots go well back into the Vedic language. Okay. Now, if you are telling an Englishman the same word Dharma, he would translate it to religion. He does not have an equivalent for Dharma. Whereas Tamil has an equivalent for Dharma. Okay. So, which of these two languages are more related in terms of culture, in terms of spirit, in terms of uh, uh, cultural proximity? Which are the two languages that are related, Sanskrit and English or Sanskrit and Tamil? Which one is, which are related more closely? It is naturally Sanskrit and Tamil, right? So, this nonsense has been going on, telling that they are different, they are different. Now, please sit. Now, if you take the entire Tamil literature, whenever they wanted to mention a person as a great person, they called him Arya. Okay? So, you have great persons throughout Tamil literature who have been called Arya. Siva has been called Arya. Agastya has been called Arya. Rama has been called Arya. And Mandodari calls Ravana Arya. Okay. So, this is all there in Tamil literature. Last, there is a literature of tribal community who is speaking about from the southernmost part of India from where I come. Okay. I come from Kanyagumari, the land's most end. The southernmost part of India, there is a tribal literature written in Tamil about the tribal areas, the mountain areas, where the tribal person is thinking about the glory of his village and he calls that village Arya Bhumi. Think about it. And last I will end with a paradox, and yes, very silly paradox. There was this uh, Robert D. Nubili, no, not Robert D. Nubili, Constantine Besky who came from Italy to convert Tamils. He learned Tamil. So he, with the help of uh, some ghost writer, he even tried to write an epic on Jesus. Okay, this happened in say, around 17th century. And what does he call Jesus? The great Aryan. Okay. So, the point is, in Tamil and Sanskrit are extremely closely related very closely related and they both come from the same origin. Okay. Thank you very much. Now uh, I request the jury to please uh, announce the winners. One, two, three. And uh, we conclude the session with the award to the winners of the question answer session. Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update.